I hope everyone had a good night's sleep and that we're ready for the second day of our workshop. So I'll start off by telling you a little bit about a consensus meeting that we performed with our joint action partners and with the aim of identifying which sector should be involved in public health emergency preparedness and response and also where we provide some recommendations about how to incorporate multi-sectoral collaboration in our national uh, public health emergency preparedness and response plans. So after all the previous studies that we conducted that I told you about yesterday, we decided to conduct a RAND modified consensus meeting with the aim of determining uh, which sectors really need to be part of our preparedness and response plans. So we used a list of 28 sectors that we had used in a systematic review that were based on the European Commission's list of economic activities. And we also provided some recommendations based on the research that we had done so far. And we had also conducted a short questionnaire within SHARP where we had asked people to list which lessons learned they could identify concerning to their management of the COVID-19 pandemic. So how did we do it? We sent out an initial questionnaire to all the joint SHARP partners and um, they could fill it in. And using that questionnaire, we identified the sectors and the recommendations that they agreed with. We then conducted a hybrid meeting in Malta in September last year, where we invited the partners to come face to face and online and to discuss the sectors and the recommendations that yeah, we're still unclear to really determine which should be included and which should not be included. We then concluded with a second questionnaire where we once again asked about those sectors that were still unclear. So at the end, we had a final set of sectors and a final set of questionnaires, uh, recommendations. So the first questionnaire, which was sent out, 41 people responded. So these were experts in the sense that these are people working in public health emergency preparedness and response, and that has some kind of affiliation to SHARP. So we said anyone that's part of SHARP, but they could also send it forward to people in their country. So the 41 experts joined uh, the questionnaire in the beginning, and they, were also had, they had also registered themselves to join the expert meeting in Malta. 30 people actually started the questionnaire and 26 completed the questionnaire. We had respondents from a multiple number of countries, including Slovenia, Greece, Portugal, Serbia, Ireland, Norway, Latvia, Italy, Estonia, Lithuania, Spain, Malta. There were also some respondents from other countries, but they are actually not part of the joint action. So it was good that it was spread wider than we had expected. We had respondents from predominantly the governmental and health sector institutions. So it'd be great to have more sectors, but I think within the joint joint action, most people who are here or who participate in the joint action are part of these two sectors. And in general, uh, most people had experience um, in terms of preparedness and response. And um, so approximately 16 people had one to five years experience and nine people had more than 10 years experience. So how did we analyze the questionnaire? So the an analysis were based on um, the scores that the respondents gave to how relevant specific sectors were in being included in preparedness and response plans. So the scores range from one to nine, and we accepted sectors which had a median of above seven. Then we also looked at the agreement. So when we looked at all the people that had responded, it must be that 70% gave the sectors and or recommendation a score of seven to nine. So in the diagram, you can see that those sectors and recommendations that had, that had both a median above seven and that there was an agreement, so more than 70% gave scores between seven to nine, were automatically accepted. Those that had a median less than seven were automatically rejected. Um, and those who had no agreement and a median equal to or less than seven were also rejected. Then there were two categories, those who had a median of seven, exactly seven, and there was agreement, or those who had no agreement, but a median of more than seven, those were the sectors and or recommendations that we had to discuss. So we held the uh, workshop in Malta and we put everyone together. We gave some presentations. Um, 
And then we asked them to really discuss why these sectors, why there was still doubt about these sectors. When should they be included? When shouldn't they be included? Why should they be included or why should they not be included? And uh, the same was for the recommendations that there was still doubt about. Why should they be included? Why should they not be included? After the workshop, we gave the questionnaire again. We could connect the questionnaire again, only focusing on these specific sectors and recommendations. There, there were 17 experts that started and completed the questionnaire from Serbia, Norway, Latvia, Lithuania, Spain, Portugal, and Malta. Again, from mostly the health sector and the governmental institutions. And the spread of experience was approximately the same. But what is most interesting is the sectors that they said must be included. So there were actually 13 sectors that were confirmed, so were accepted, that should be included in preparedness and response plans. There were the, first of all, the sectors that we have already heard about before when I discussed the um, when I discuss the systematic review, so human health industry, governmental institutions, experts, and civil society, that came up again. So those are clearly important. However, there are a couple of more sectors that came up. So the agriculture, forestry, fishery, and the environment, ICT service activities, the transportation and points of entry, education and trainings. Then we also have energy and water supplies, uh, sewage, and waste management, media and communication, veterinary activities, and chemical industries. So they were also stated to be necessary during all phases of preparedness and response, and also recovery. Then there was one, ser uh, one sector, the personal service, administrative support, and security and investigation activities, that was accepted for the response phase. So this, re yeah, this was mostly referring to all the human resources that's necessary uh, during the response phase. So I think this is a good guideline for when one is developing or adapting preparedness and response plan to really consider, do we have these sectors? And if you don't have it or you choose not to have it, that you can really give argumentations for yourself or for your team why you don't have these sectors in your predetermined preparedness and response plan. Then there are a couple of recommendations that were accepted about aspects of multi-sector collaboration that should be included in national public health emergency plans. And these include that, that these state that the, the plan should include a communication plan specifying predetermined sectors. So these could be the sectors that I have just named or not, but it should be clearly defined and predetermined which sectors uh, should be contacted and there should be a communication plan about how they should be contacted. There should uh, be a predetermined network of sectors. The plan should also include the contact details of representatives of the predetermined sectors. One topic that did arise during the workshop is that it is difficult to find a representative of specific sectors. Who is the representative of the media, for example? But it is something that we should try to crystallize or at least have certain people that can be contacted when, for example, the media should be involved in the preparedness response and recovery. And the, uh, the plan should also include a common goal or common goals and also a common approach uh, that should need to be predetermined and shared with the sectors. They should also include protocols concerning transparency with regards to the decision making. So it is clear for all those involved, all sectors involved, why certain decisions are made and the process towards the decision making. There should also be a clear hierarchy of the sectors. And define, there should be a defined activation criteria for the involvement of the sectors, because I think it's unrealistic to think that all the sectors need to be involved at every single moment of the preparedness, response and recovery. But it should be clear for those who lead the these activities, when should specific sectors be activated? When should specific sectors be contacted? And that these sectors also know that when specific events happen, that they are expected to react or act in a certain way. There should be an actor responsible for the coordination of multisexual collaboration. And there should be, if possible, a secure platform where the different sectors can share information. So this is a list of recommendations that we hope can guide those uh, making preparedness and response plans. 
and really incorporating multisexual collaboration in their plans. Of course, it's not that easy, and there's still some questions that were raised during the study. I think that we require policymakers to also think about when they're making their plans, but it also gives room for academics to think about it a little bit more. So we based our list of sectors on the European Commission's list of sectors and economic activities. But the question is, is this really the most suitable way of defining sectors? There, there, is, there are not many other options currently, and defining sectors is very difficult. So the question is, is it really most important to define the sectors, or is it most important to define the task, roles, and responsibilities that need to be fulfilled during preparedness, response, and recovery, and then identify the actors that can fulfill those roles? I think that is something that perhaps in the future workshops or, or even today that we can think about, is it more important to really define the sectors or these roles? I hope that this gave some clarification on our workshop that we conducted in Malta and the list of sectors and recommendations that came forward. Are there any questions? You can uh, put the slide in front uh, with the, uh, yeah, the main uh, sectors. All right. Yes, please. Uh, I didn't know this, but did you mention also the third sector, like Red Cross? Because they, uh, in, many, in many countries, they saw a lot about the Red Cross role to support the water in this. And for example, in Finland, we made a lot of work uh, with the COVID-19, for example. But I didn't see that. You know, it's easy to yes. you know, yeah. civil society would be the fourth sector, also, so which is not so well organized. So it's there is uh, some big organizations who are really supporting and they are in a role, and it's very essential to also share uh, uh, information between authorities and uh, these organizations. No, I think that's very true. Um, when such organizations were discussed, they were put on the civil society. But I must say, and it's very nice that you are here to provide this perspective, these organizations were not discussed that often during the workshop, which shows that it's always good to have different perspectives around the table. Yeah. Only just to add, it is a really tough. Using the, the current EU um, sector descriptions is really tough. And I think uh, it was interesting in the initial slide, you said 26 um, only can think about the total who started. Because when you look at it, you just say, oh, this is so confusing. What does that mean? What does that sector of description mean? And so um, it, 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 the work that you're doing to help clarify this, or perhaps change it, and this is what the, I think is the really lovely idea, and this is changing it to roles and and acting organisations to fulfil that role. That's far more meaningful to talk about a type of organisation rather than this old question that I don't think it's been looked at in 30 years, uh, the EU sector definition. So well done for spotting that. Okay, um, I was uh, wondering the ones who were not selected, uh, was there a common ground why not or was look into that um, why not or yeah, in general, then the participants said, thought they weren't relevant in that specific um, in that specific part of preparedness, response, and re recovery. Uh, they had to make for themselves a hierarchy. Who do they think can contribute significantly at that specific moment? Keeping in mind the efficiency, of course, uh, during preparedness, response, and recovery, and those that were not included, they felt that preparedness, response, and recovery could take place without them from the beginning. But of course all the sectors can play a role. So if it is necessary that they be involved, they can be contacted. But this is really about the sectors that need to be involved in the preparedness and response plans. And I really have actually a say at the table from the beginning. Okay, because it, uh, also the experts were coming from governance and yeah. the, the health sector. So maybe they are relevant for other governance sectors or um, which is still also preparedness, but maybe less directly relevant for, for health uh, experts. But... Yes, I think that's that's very true that we had a, a kind of um, bias towards specific kinds of preparedness and response. But to be honest, I think those who are making the preparedness and response plans are usually from the government and the health institutions. Well, 
Thank you, Sandra, for, for this last uh, presentation of all your work.